Hello everyone. Welcome to the CG Cookie live stream. My name is Kent Trammell and today we are starting um, a three week, three and a half week journey with Blender 2.8 um, from getting started from a Blender perspective um, using a project that's also um, applicable and can be a challenge for all levels of experience. Um, it's gonna be fun. We're all in this together. It's been a year since I ran a class and if someone can tell me that everything's green, um, I don't want to be talking in silence like I, like I can do occasionally. But um, for as far as I can tell, it's all green. Perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, so it's been about a year since we ran a class. Um, we've been caught up in 2.8, trying to stay ahead of the curve. How can we best teach it to you guys? Like, be using the development versions. What kind of training can we make? Um, and so there's been a pause in the class stuff, but it turns out to be a perfect time to start this specific class because Blender 2.8 was officially released like an hour ago, or at least officially announced an hour ago. I've been using the official version since this morning when they when they uploaded the actual uh, uh, zip files. So or I have like a tar, I guess. Anyway, so yeah, Blender 2 Blender 2.8 is here. The hype is real, as some were saying. Yeah, this is one of the most exciting times for Blender since I've used the program. Um, it's being noticed, especially by the professional industry, more than it ever has. The development is exciting new tools, new uh, collaborators, new uh, uh, devs being added to the team. It's just, it is a great time to be and to become a Blender artist. Um, yeah, and also a good time to, to start this class. Uh, so uh, to set some expectations about what this specific stream will be like, uh, it's going to be about two hours, and the first half hour will be, um, you know, well, the first hour will be especially beginner oriented in that we're going to talk about what this class is about, like the uh, details about the format, trying to clarify things, um, again, set expectations properly, also discuss Blender at a foundational level. If you've taken the class before in a previous version, you will have heard this primarily, or, uh, for the most part, already. Um, but uh, if for the advanced people who have taken this or who have either taken the class or have experience with Blender, please stick around because I would love to have some assistance for answering questions. You can tell that the chat is, uh, we have a lot of new people in here. It's pretty active today. And um, any assistance, if, if I don't get to a question fast enough, if, if you could fill in and, and answer that, that would be awesome. So yeah, if you have already heard this content before, um, but if you could stay to be a resource, that would be very helpful to me. Um, and then, so yeah, first half hour is going to be a lot of talking about um, the class and what Blender is. Then we're going to dive into Blender for the second half hour and and open it like it's our first time. We're going to talk about the UI. Uh, if you're brand new to Blender, you know what's important, what you can, what's not so important starting out, and uh, hopefully get you hitting the ground running. And then the second hour, we will actually be building. Uh, one of the assets uh, for that will be homework for you guys. So yeah, with that said, let's get right into discussing some details about the class. Um, oh, real quick, for anyone who's new, in the chat you can press, uh, it's a it's a hotkey, um, brackets and a Q in the middle. A capital Q will add a question tag. That way it shows up very clearly in the chat and I can you know hone in on those questions to be able to ask them. Feel free to let questions go. Um, there's a question from Tobles. Can you give inf uh, information about which objects are allowed for the class? Definitely, I'll be going over that. And there is going to be some freedom, you know, for people who, um, you know, want to challenge themselves. Like there is going to be some freedom, but but uh, some a little bit of of boundary and limits as well. Um, so we'll get to that in just a little bit. But first, let let's see. Uh, yeah, I have a question for you. Is this your first time participating in a CG cookie class? If it is, can you press zero in the chat? I would love to know, you know, ballpark, how many people have never taken a class before? Okay. Wow, several. Okay. Wow, several. Good grief. It's more than I expected. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. I, for one, am a huge fan of the class format. And if you talk to anybody who has taken classes, Hopefully they had a good experience. Generally, it's been very positive, and some people, you know, are I've joined only for the classes. They, I think it's a it's a big leap forward um, given the the uh, time commitment and uh, uh, instructor involvement. But we'll get to that. So welcome for the people who are brand new, and 
the next follow-up question, what levels of Blender experience do we have here? Um, press one in the chat if you have zero to one year of experience, press two for one to two years, three for more than two years, and then four if you're experienced with 3D and you're looking to try Blender for the first time. So if you know how to use Maya, 3ds Max, or, or ZBrush or something, but you're 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 into 2.8 and you want to try that for the first time, I'm curious if we have any of those. Let's look through here. Okay, we have some threes, some twos, some ones. Okay, we do have a four. Excellent. Another four. Perfect. Wow, this is going to be great. I'm really excited about this. Awesome. All right. So that confirms my suspicion that there is a wide range of people, which is great because this this cl this class is intended for kind of all audiences. And that can be difficult, but but I think I think it's going to work out to where um, everyone's going to have things to learn from this. Um, so what exactly is a CG cookie class? It's really mirrored very simply like a college or high school class. Uh, but online with CG Cookie. That's, you know, summarize what it's supposed to be. And to break break that down, um, you know, the difference is mostly with CG Cookie, before, without classes, you know, it's it's self-guided, um, you know, it's self-motivated for you to navigate our site and, and find courses on your own, go through learning flows on your own, and basically it's self-motivated. And with this, this is more of a communal effort. We're in this thing together for a committed amount of time. Um, this is the uh, I believe it's the best way to learn through CG Cookie, um, and some of the reasons are it's the closest instructor interaction that we can offer. Um, plus, there's a committed time frame, which is which means I am guaranteeing my presence in the class uh, for the next three weeks. So you can it's a much more guaranteed uh, opportunity to have your questions answered, to get feedback from me. Also, the commitment goes both ways. So it's best if you commit your time to the class as well. Um, and since it is only three weeks, most people can manage that. Um, whereas if you have like an open-ended, uh, you know, self-guided kind of commitment to CG Cookie, it can, it's easy to kind of lose that motivation. But for three weeks, like let's, let's all be in this together and we're going to come out uh, learning a bunch of things. So um, it's also a combination of all our learning formats. We have several different diversified ways to learn through CG Cookie, whether it's courses, tutorials, exercises, learning flows, live events, articles, community discussion. This is supposed to connect all of them into a cohesive format, again, for the for three weeks and to, to make them all make sense together um, and create a fuller experience. Um, and there's a big emphasis on communal learning and motivation from deadlines. So we've got homework assignments each week. And by having a deadline, you know, I, I think that that motivates people to actually get stuff done. If, if you don't have the deadline, oh, I'll get to it tomorrow. Oh, I, I, I'll get to it next week. You know, but this one, you know, you got to get to it this week. And so you see more work typically come out of a class. Um, and I'm just going to check, make sure I'm not missing any questions. Good, good deal. I do want to, I've said, I've done this class several times. I want to try and get through this stuff as efficiently as possible and not bore you. By the way, if you're watching this in the future on YouTube, you can skip through. You don't. You probably won't be interested in this. You can skip through until you see the Blender user interface. Um, but for now, for the people taking the class, this stuff is uh, important. Next, oh yeah, let's get into. So that's kind of an overview of the class, the our heart behind it, our intention behind it. Now, what is what is Blender, right? Well, I've already said it's extremely exciting time. It's an extremely exciting time right now to get into Blender. Um, I think my next slide is, yeah, so let me say why. Um, most of you probably know the news that Epic Games, the creator of Fortnite, recently uh, funded, um, granted the Blender Foundation $1.2 million in a no-strings-attached grant to push Blender development forward. This is incredible. I don't think anywhere near this level of donation has been made to Blender, and I cannot... I cannot wait to see what the what the foundation does for the development. This is in this is insane validation from the uh, professional industry. I was just knocked off my feet by this news, and it uh, yeah, I've never quite seen such validation before. So that is extremely exciting. A couple years back, Valve, um, the game developer, also uh, committed to donating to Blender. I don't remember if there was a value amount that we were aware of, but they committed. So this was just this is incredible. I also noticed on Twitter this. 
this interchange that happened um, from from the a professional who works for VFX Labs, which is part of the Disney family, and um, they are a Maya studio, though so, so like top of the line, you know, uh, visual effects studio. They use Maya and disappointed with the 2.8 or, or uh, 2018, 2019 Maya versions. They've looked into Blender 2.8, coupled with the excitement of 2.8, and he references the the epic um, and Ubisoft. Yeah, that's right. Ubisoft is also um, the their Ubisoft Animation Studio is going to be switching to Blender. In- incredible, um, incredible milestones for for Blender. But um, yeah, this this person is talking about how they're looking into Blender 2.8. Which uh, I found very exciting, um, and also you, you, most of you hopefully are aware that Next Gen, the Netflix full feature animation, uh, was entirely made with Blender. Well, I think they used Houdini for some of the the explosion and particle effects, but like ninety percent uh, was was done with with Blender. So yeah, it's it's very exciting to be into Blender. I think people who have been using it have kind of expected this to happen at some point, like inevitably Blender is going to get better and people cannot ignore it. Professionals cannot ignore it anymore. But, um, that is like, we're, 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 we're on the cusp, I think of, of truly changing the industry more than it's already been changed. So anyway, that's exciting coming from the professional side, like using professional software when my career started and then discovering Blender, I've always been a little bit of an evangelist, like I think it's going to happen. You should pro- professionals, colleagues, you should try a blender. It's, it's really game changing and to see it happening um, and just keep getting better. And when professionals get involved, um, that means they're going to develop onto the software as well. And it's going to improve blender. So we're all going to benefit from it. Um, the more professionals get involved. So anyway, exciting time. Um, most of you know that the hype is definitely real. I think I saw a question. Let me make sure. Um, all right. Now I don't think just how to explain the question. All right. Uh, the question tag next. So yeah, let's get back to what is Blender? Why am I starting from the foundation? Really? It's uh, even though a lot of people here will know all this stuff. If you're here watching at all, you probably have an idea of what Blender is. But when I started trying to understand 3D, I really wish I had someone to explain some of these foundational, almost assume assumable things. So I'm just going to go through it quickly, but to quote the website, Blender.org, Blender is the free and open source 3D creation suite that supports the entirety of the 3D pipeline, modeling, rigging, animation, simulation, rendering, compositing, motion tracking, even video editing and game creation. It is truly the complete package and it, it does it does as much, if not more, than its, comp- its professional competitors like Maya and 3ds Max. Um, and it does them all very competently, if not the best, like I think of the video editor is arguably not the best, but it is competent and people like use them competently and can get good work out of it. So anyway, it does the whole thing. And Blender is also free software, which also is probably common knowledge. Uh, this is a this is a screen capture from the website. It's free to use, it's free to change, free to share, free to sell your work. Now, if you have any aspirations for being like any kind of professional with Blender, even if you don't expect it now, what if you get really good at Blender and you want to, you find people wanting to buy prints of your renders, it's good to know that Blender is truly free to even sell your work. It's in, it's, um, it's a gift, frankly, to the creative uh, community at large. The, what you can do with Blender, the fact that no strings attached, it's free to use. Um, it's a beautiful testament to the potential of open source. I would say it's not the rule of open source software, meaning that, um, it's not the rule that all open source software is great and competent and competent, um, but it can be. Blender is is evidence that when the community gets together, it can create a truly amazing software that is professionally recognized. Um, so yeah, it's awesome and it's free for those reasons. I also want to follow that up with Blender did not materialize out of thin air, meaning it wasn't created for free. It wasn't you know bestowed upon us by an alien race, no strings attached. It took time, the true currency, and a lot of people over the years, a lot of artists using it over the years um, to make it what it is. And so if you find that you get into Blender and you use it and you enjoy it, I want to strongly ask you to consider donating um, however little, however much, um, because it really isn't free in that sense. Like it, it needs the community to support it to continue on. And uh, that's my little spiel. Now, 
some things about what Blender can do. And I know I've missed some questions at this point. Let me just check. Maybe just one from Tobel's, how is the outcome when compared to ZBrush? So if you're asking how does Blender compare to ZBrush sculpting, I would say ZBrush is definitely the superior app because it only does sculpting oriented things. So it's had years to develop and innovate on those tools. And I will also say as a ZBrush was the only software that I purchased um, outright whenever I graduated college. Partly it was the only one that I could afford, but it was also my favorite software. So in other words, I was a big fan of ZBrush and then I discovered Blender and I have not had to go back to ZBrush for sculpting since. I know that there are other users here um, in the CG Cookie community who went the other way. They found Blender and now they use ZBrush totally fine, but I can honestly say I've never had to go back to ZBrush. So it fits into that extremely competent category um, that I've done all my sculpting with, with ZBrush and or with Blender and, and it's been great. Um, all right, so a couple ideas about what Blender can do. Again, it would have been nice if someone just laid these out for me very cleanly when I started looking into this stuff because I, I didn't even know how to search for these terms. I knew that Toy Story and the video games my brother played could do 3D, like we're created with a computer in 3D, but I didn't even know how to search for these terms. Um, and so just to quickly go over what Blender can do. Um, this is, these are visual effects or abbreviated VFX. And typically this is categorized in like movies and film where you take live action film and then add digital elements on top of it um, to, to create the illusion that these things that don't exist do exist. For example, like the robots in Transformers, you've got superheroes in the Avengers movie and then the very, um, the very, uh, humbling uh, a reality of the green screen and how little is actually real in those movies. Um, and then I think I have a little slide for moving on. Yeah, so then I kind of overlaid, this is a Blender art from, from the creator. I think his name's Machine is what he goes by with a three um, at the end instead of an E, but um, this is, he does the decal machine, mesh machine. He created this robot, which I think is at, on par in the quality of like, of a Transformers. So Blender can do this. This is created in Blender. Also, we've got Tears of Steel, which um, uh, was a Blender open movie that 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 pushed the VFX pipeline forward in the Blender context, filmed on green screen with actors, and then the background completely replaced digitally. Um, so Blender can do that as well. On the bottom left, this is from the television series called uh, Man in a High Castle. Um, most of the visual effects, especially the ones done by Barnstorm VFX, were accomplished with Blender. And so you can see like that's about as high profile of a job as you can get being used with Blender, um, being created with Blender. So yeah, can definitely do visual effects. Also, of course, animation. We've got um, uh, Finding Nemo, which was not created with Blender, um, but... I will, but but especially today, today's Blender, I will always stand behind the argument that it could have been created with Blender. Blender is is so good now that I, I think it's only up to the artists themselves as to the quality that comes out of Blender. So I put that there just to show you, like, in case you didn't know what animation was, Finding Nemo is an animation, um, and Blender can create this stuff. It created the bottom left Cosmos Laundromat, another open source movie from the Blender uh, Animation Studio, entirely created with Blender. I've already mentioned Next Gen. And then the upper right is just a show my kids watch. And I always think like, oh, that could have been made with Blender. But um, anyway, animation, feature animation, completely computer generated um, uh, art form can be created with Blender. And also game asset creation can also be accomplished with Blender. In the upper left, we've got a completely Blender game, including I think the Blender game engine from Feral 3D. Um, this is, it's called The Shadows Lengthen. He's got a, a Patreon that he is um, actively developing this game through. And uh, it's pretty cool to see someone develop. He's, he's got, he's worked for like Marvel, I believe. And so he's got like a really high, high quality level of skill and is applying that, um, creating a cool game with Blender. This is uh, Blender as well from, from I believe, 80, 80 Burrows and then bottom right. This is a CG cookie game that was on the, uh, on the iPad, iOS a few years ago. I'm not sure if it's still on the App Store or not, but it was entirely made with Blender and, um, and the game engine being Unity. Um, so note that I do say game asset creation, especially meaning creating all the visual elements of a game. Blender can definitely do that stuff. It used to have a game engine, but that's sort of 
the development didn't didn't really continue on that. And so it's kind of, it's it's no no longer in 2.8, but but creating the assets themselves is definitely a part of Blender. Obviously, Blender uh, like Arkham, Batman, Arkham, whatever was not created with Blender, but it could be. It could be. I it absolutely could be if if the artists that made that use Blender instead. Like I will I will argue that all uh, um, eternally. Let's say uh, questions. I think I've missed a few questions. Let me check. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a couple. Um, is there any indication that ray tracing will be slowly become real time rendering in 3D software like it is in video games? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, one of the beautiful things about Blender is is uh, it if it's not ahead of the curve, creating things that that don't exist in other software, I think of dynamic topology. That was one that, as far as I know, was in Blender before it was in any of the professional apps. Um, and but if it doesn't go that way, it can go the other way. If it appears in Unreal Engine, like real-time ray tracing, I guarantee that technology is going to seep into Blender at some point. Already we have Eevee and, um, I mean, I'm enjoying Eevee. I, I have, I've not really found, the things I've done with Eevee, I've, I've like, I've not really needed real-time ray tracing, but, um, so I'm still kind of in the, in the honeymoon phase of, of Eevee being into Blender 2.8. Um, however, I can almost guarantee that real-time ray tracing is is going to be in Blender in the next probably couple years, I would guess, at the latest. But um, I don't know of any specific indication if it's happening right now. But um, sounds like Kent's paid from Blender.org. <laughs> I'm definitely not. Definitely not. I am a big Blender fan, um, and, uh, and I do support Blender for sure. But no, I'm not paid by them. <laughs> um, any other question? Uh, okay, sorry, you asked the same question twice. I got gotcha. you. Um, all right, cool. So that's game asset creation, and then a bunch of other stuff that Blender can do. Video editing, which is like I see as a nice bonus. Like um, all the Blender open movies are edited with the video sequence editor inside Blender. That's a great asset to have. Two um, D animation, the grease pencil developments in the past. Few, well, the past year have been tremendous, and I think all it's going to take is a studio to pick this up and make a TV show with it. I think it's right on the edge of being a super legit 2D specific animator uh, animation tool. Uh, you've got motion tracking, a uh, very competent uh, motion tracker, which has to do with VFX, if you don't know what that is, like tracking the movement of the film footage and translating that into 3D to add your digital elements to. Very important process. I don't know if, uh, again, I don't know if Maya, 3ds Max, or any of the other competitors do motion tracking. It's usually done with like Synthize um, or a separate app, as far as I know. But that's pretty cool that that's included with Blender. 3D printing as well, that's that's exploding in popularity, and I think it will only get, become a more crucial part of of our reality in the in the near and and future going forward. So Blender being a modeling tool, it can definitely um, that's a pretty cool thing to be able to do 3D printing. So yeah, Blender is just, I guess the picture I'm trying to paint is Blender is this super deep well of creative freedom um, in multiple aspects, uh, various aspects. And and uh, it's, it's just that kind of creative potential that captured me, that keeps me learning new stuff all the time. I think I'll, I'll never know all of Blender. I don't think anyone really can say they do. Um, it's just, it's a limitless sort of creation thing. Um, so it's a pretty great, Pretty great situation, pretty great thing to get involved with. And I think that's all of me talking about Blender. Okay, so what will we do with Blender in this specific class? We're going to be creating these assets. Um, in the syllabus, I definitely outlined the three on the left. Uh, simple wooden sign, simple barrel, simple uh, shield, a uh, shield, a sword. And, um, and then I also added the treasure chest, which is the course I released um, about not quite two weeks ago. But um, I released it partially in mind to be the foundation of the, the class that we're taking. So you can watch those chapters on your own outside of the live stream for, for, um, for additional information for how this workflow, creation modeling workflow goes in case I'm not there to, to ask a question in the middle of a live stream. Um, but yeah, you can pick any of these four assets to create uh, as homework. Now, I know that uh, some of you are going to want to create other things, like uh, you, maybe these don't suit your fancy and, you, and you'd like to, to create something more unique. The only thing that I ask 
about that is is you don't go too far. Like I'm not going to say you can't, you have to model this no matter what, but I I would prefer that you not create like a spaceship or something, something completely different from all the assets that we're going to be working on. Um, maybe not like a car, unless it's like a, a medieval catapult or something like that, because the general aesthetic and is is kind of medieval ish. And so I would love it if all of us stuck to that because we're all going to be able to inform each other about, about this workflow. Like we're all going to be more on the same page. Whereas if we start doing some of you more advanced users start doing random things, an environment, for example, you're just going to be on a, on a different Island than us. So within that, I would like for you to keep the limitation of keep the box of medieval low poly, um, but if you want to create, if you want to change the sword design and be something completely unique, more detailed, um, make the the texture much more detailed, more realistic, I say 100% go for that. Challenge yourself and go beyond the assignment. Um, but again, like try and stick to the medieval the medieval box. Um, so you could do a katana. Yeah, yeah. I I don't think that's a problem at all because it's a sword. It could do very well low poly, and probably during medieval times. I don't know my world history that well, but they were probably doing samurai stuff on the other half of the world. So yeah, it works. And did I miss any other questions? No. Awesome. I keep thinking I'm seeing more questions than I am. I'm I'm too noobish. How many vertices are low poly? Tobles, um, there's not really a number to put on there. You know, it's not like, 19,999 polygons is low poly and then 20,000 is high poly. It's not that, it's more of a an approach, a, a mindset for uh, for a style for how how the assets are created. And I'm going to go over that stuff when when I get into the modeling portion. Um but you know that will I think that will make sense to you as we go a little bit further. Um oh, I have 3 minutes to finish this and then get into Blender. Uh, da, 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 da. Medieval realistic. I mean, if you want to go more stylized, I'm fine with that. Um, I would just say, like, try not to go super, super simple because I, it's going to be hard for me to to distinguish super, super simple from kind of like not putting forth that much effort. And I would like to I would like to see you know some effort with with a little more detail. You can do stylized detail, but like maybe not super simple if that makes sense. Um, yeah, also low poly will mean everything's running very smoothly. If we tried to go super high poly, it would risk um, slow down in Blender, stuff like that. Maybe a question for next week, but can I use substance tools for texturing? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm trying to think why I would possibly say no. But I mean, we, we typically, if with an exercise, you know, we recognize that substance is a fantastic tool and it would be just feel weird for us to say, no, you can't use that. Um, I guess just make sure that it's it's a legitimate copy. I, I do not, I, I pirated software all through college and learned to not support that. So um, um, yeah, make, as long as it's legitimate, I don't have it. I don't have a problem with it. Okay. Um, next, class fact. All right, go over the class navigation. I need to make this quick. Um, and class navigation, yeah, that's on our website. So in case you don't know, the class format is technically like unofficial, meaning we don't have, there's not like a, a, a class tab up here in the Blender stuff. You know, we got courses, exercises. We don't have an official system. This is, we're in like a prolonged beta testing phase for the format. And uh, just whenever we get the resources to be able to build the official system, like I'm still, um, I'm still pushing for that, still pitching that and, and trying to make it happen. But for now, um, it's it's an unofficial system. We're using things that already exist on the site and it can get confusing. So I wanna go over exactly what, how to navigate the, the class on, on the website. The homepage is in the forum. So go to community forum and it's going to be pinned to the top. So BC1 1908, if you see that, that um, label BC1 1908 on anything that is related to the class. Um, but in the home page, this is where you're going to find, I mean, most of you probably know this, but in the description, you'll see that it's the syllabus. All right. Um, there's kind of general information at the very top. I'm going to be adding announcements to try and, you know, it's the best way that I can like, uh, give news or, or, 
or spread information to just the people in the class. So check that periodically for any new information that might come up. Um, you've got your syllabus so you can see each week what's going to happen, what is expected of you, the homework assi assignment, um, links to the live events. So that is the class homepage information. And then below that, this is general discussion. If you've got just uh, generic questions to ask that could pertain to everybody, ask, ask it here. Don't hesitate. I will be checking this plenty. Um, and uh, beyond the homepage class, we're also, for anyone doing homework, you're going to create your own homework thread. Um, so let me show you an example of that because we don't have any quite yet. But if we go back to the forum and I type in an old class code, BC1, whoops, BC1-1808, you'll see examples of homework. And so you create a thread with the title BC1-1808, 1908 for this class, homework, comma, and then your name or your username. And inside those threads, you will you will post work in progress. You will ask questions specific to your homework assignment. And I will be checking these uh, regularly, uh, daily, um, especially especially Monday through through Thursday, Friday. Um, I will be in there daily. I'll probably check once or twice over the weekend, but not as consistently as during the week. But um, uh, yeah, so this is this is where your homework stuff takes place. And your specific when you want to submit a homework assignment, like at the end of the week, all you do is post um, or there's going to be an example pretty soon. Maybe this person didn't quite finish the assignment. OK, um, let me let me try a different one. I know, Phil, I know you probably. What? Maybe not. And I'm trying to find an example of someone who did. Okay, here you go. This is what I would expect just to, so I can identify what the true, um, ver like the final version of your homework is. Um, do a new post reply and homework submission week one or week two or week three. And then if you have anything to say about it, like did you learn anything particularly that you'd like to share um, or any other information that goes into, if you have a backstory, if you want to add a backstory for your asset or something fun like that, um, Please, please post that information there. I will then come in and, and grade it with, with a A, B, C, D, E, or F kind of value. E, I put E in there, just A, B, C, D, F, um, and, uh, and then give you some notes. I'm gonna, that, that's, I think one of the most valuable parts of the class is getting, getting feedback both from me, but also from others, your, your peers. Um, so that is the homework thread. And I feel like I'm missing some questions. I assume we'll be having VAs again. Yes, I'm going to go over that definitely. Um, do we have to submit our, your homework before the next lesson or are we free to post when we have time? Uh, that's going to be, uh, I'm going to go over that soon uh, in the next few minutes. Um, but I think that's, if there's any questions about the format, how to submit homework, anything I've gone over, let me know. But um, yes, yeah, so that is the class navigation. Here's the answer. Homework is due each Sunday before midnight, your own time, your relative time. So the, the idea being that I will log in to my computer on Monday and at some point on Monday, I will have everyone's submissions in and I can start giving feedback, start uh, grading those, um, ideally before I stream on Tuesday. Um, but sometimes, you know, if we get too many, uh, homework assignments that I can't give adequate feedback quick enough, you know, it might overlap. But homework is due each Sunday before midnight your time. Um, is the school linked to your profile only for CG Cookie because I don't have it? Oh, yeah. So the school, let's see at the top, that is, um, I guess it's visible for me because I'm an admin on the site. But um, there we have a school system like for for high schools or, or something, colleges that that buy set like a group a group of CG Cookie accounts for their students. That's what the school thing is, um, but it's only relevant to them really. Um, do we need to put all homework in one thread or create a forum thread per homework? One one forum thread, and you you post all of your homework in that thread using this format, where where you add homework submission week one, homework submission week two on the reply itself. But yeah, one one thread per student, per class. Does that make sense? So yeah, just the one homework thread. Um, it'd get crazy if we all had four threads each. That would be nuts. 
All right, I think I'm about done going over these details. Okay, what one of the one more thing um, about sharing blend files. Sometimes you, if you have an issue with Blender and you're like something's not working, can I get some help? Usually, I'll I'll ask to see the blend file. And our forum unfortunately does not uh, support posting like files. It's a security measure both for us and also for you. Um, so it's unfortunate, but um, the best way to share blend files is through either Dropbox. Google Drive, OneDrive, or equivalent file hosting service. Uh, because at this point in time, like most people have one of those and you just upload the file, copy the share link, and then uh, paste it in your thread. And I'll be able to download that, take a look at your file. But that has come up and uh, causes confusion. Uh, next, uh, what are homework grades all about? Um, I do, I actually enjoy this part. Um, it's the only thing that we really do like graded stuff like this. And I, I think grades, again, it's, it's just a vehicle for getting feedback and for getting some sort of measurement for, for how you did, I guess. Like, uh, and, and it's a, it's an A, B, C, D, F system. You get zero points for F, which I don't know that I've only, I've only given F's for not doing the homework. Um, and then D you get 10 points, uh, C, you get 20, B, you get 30, A, you get 40 points. Um, and then you can also get like D plus for 25 points, 15 points, I can't remember. Um, but A plus is 45 points, basically an additional five points. Um, and the way you get a uh, plus is like, if you get A plus, it's that you accomplished the expectation of the assignment and then you went further. So let's say you modeled let me go back. You modeled the sword, but then you added your own design. Like you either you added, you changed the design yourself. You um, added more details, for example. And that's like you met the assignment and then went a little beyond. And that's when you get some extra points. Um, um, and then let's see anything else about the report card. At the end, I tally all the points up and you get, you know, like, for example, Pavel got 176 points by the end of the class. Um, so it, yeah, it's kind of a fun, there's a little bit of competition. I think people, when you have this kind of measurement, it, it, I don't know, it does something in you to push you to go a little further. Um, but again, the, the most valuable part is getting the feedback specifically. So you know how to improve, uh, any questions I've, I've given a coveted, uh, 50 points, like the a plus plus that would be like doing the things I said for the sword and then creating an environment around it to give it full context. Like that's just going way above and beyond. But um, I don't think I've ever, have I ever given an A++++? I don't know that I've ever done that. Um, anyway, all right. So that's the homework assignment, the uh, report card. I will post a, a link to this so everyone can see um, throughout the month how, how you're doing. Keep track of that. And what else do I have to talk about? Volunteer assistance. So Aaron, you brought this up. Volunteer assistants are, uh, I mean, it's probably self-explanatory some degree to some degree, but it's you guys taking the class, wanting to go a, a little further and being a resource to your peers and to me as well. Um, so typically these are like more, maybe more on the advanced end. You, you, you know how to do the assignments relatively easily. It's more for exercise rather than like learning from scratch. And so you can, you have a little extra time and you're willing to give extra time to do things primarily like answer questions in the homepage and homework threads. I'm gonna be in there uh, consistently, but like if we have, we had 160 some people RSVP to the to the to this stream and therefore sorted the class. Um, and if we actually had that many people, that'd be very difficult for me to keep track of and stay on top of for the whole duration of the class. However, if I have a couple uh, volunteer assistants, that's gonna really help me. And, and you're gonna be an extra set of eyes and ears uh, to help your peers out. Also, you know, you can relay things to me. Uh, you're like a moderator essentially for, for the class. And then if we did again, have that many people, I could potentially off like ask you to help grade. And we've never had to do that before, but like I kind of top out at like 50 people. If we have 50 homework assignments, more than 50, then, then I'm gonna have to ask for some additional help. Now, what's in it for you, so to speak, um, if you actively participate in the class and you're a volunteer assistant, um, I'm gonna, I'll double your class, your homework XP by the end. 
Um, and then if also, this is kind of new. I don't think I've ever uh, said this, but like if you want to be a volunteer assistant only, if you've been using 2.8, um, you're well aware of it. You've already taken the treasure chest course. You've already like, you know, you, you know how to do this stuff and you don't necessarily want to participate in the class doing homework, but you would like to be a resource of, of Virginia. I keep wanting to say Virginia because I live in Virginia, VA, but volunteer assistant only. I'll give you 100 XP, 100 XP. So um, if you're interested in being this type of resource, please email me, kent at cgcookie.com with the subject, I volunteer as tribute, and uh, I will, we'll get, we'll get communicating about that. But they, we, we, in the past, we typically have anywhere from two to three people do this, and it's always a tremendous help. Um, the, the fellow students find them extremely helpful. Obviously, I find them helpful, but um, it's a good thing. So if you want to, I appreciate it. Um, Check in for questions. All right. I think we're about done with this. Yes, we are about done. So a couple ground rules. I, I, I feel that it's just smart to do this, but I, we've never really had a problem. Um, but let's keep this a welcome place for beginners. Sometimes it's easy to, to assume that people know things and, and beginners can feel overwhelmed and, and um, intimidated by people who know a lot more than them. So let's keep this a welcome place. No question is too dumb or beginnerish. And uh, this, this don't flex thing, uh, really, I think it just comes like, you know, when you're flexing and when you're not, and other people will probably know that too, but especially you will know if you're flexing. And that means if you come in here as, as an advanced user, you do incredible work that's better that better than everyone else, better than me, better than like you're clearly beyond the scope of this class. And and the important part of this is that you don't help others. If you just post your work, you're kind of quiet. Here's my work. Look at it. You know, like that's not really what this is for. If you're better than me, better than everyone else and you still want to participate, please do. But share what you know. Be a resource to people. Do work that's way better than all of us. But like help us understand how to get to where you are. That's not flexing, okay? But hopefully that makes sense what what is flexing and, and why we wanna avoid it. Um, yeah, welcome experienced users, please be a resource, all right? Those are the ground rules. Again, never had a problem with it. I, I, I think this community is incredible, one of the safest places to be. Um, a couple questions. Oh, so flexing, yeah, as a non-native speaker, it means showing off, it means, um, is there a better term than showing off? It's uh yeah, sh I mean, show off. I don't know of a better term. If anyone has a better one, let them know. But it's it's like being arrogant and and showing everyone that you're better than them, as if you are. Um, can you go, however, how to submit homework again? Sure, absolutely. So in in the class uh, forum, in the community forum, we've got the home page. All right, so this is the class that is the homeroom essentially. General conversation is gonna happen here. Now, when you submit homework, you're gonna create your own forum or your own uh, forum thread here. It's just like this. So create topic and it's BC1-1908. By the way, this is Blender class number one, the beginner class, um, That and then the date or the, the time period. So it's 2019, the month of August. That's what that code means. And then you type, um, the code plus homework, comma, your name, or your username, whatever your preference is. So you create this thread, and this is where you submit your homework. Now within the homework, let me go back to show you that example, BC1-1808. This is a previous class example. And uh, yikes, looks like I missed a post here. Um, who was the one that did? It was Aaron, I think. All right, so Aaron's a great example. Um, like he he was great about posting work in progress so we can see how he's progressing throughout the week. Um, if, if he runs into any problems, we'll be able to help him. Um, also, it's just, it's fun to see. I think it's rewarding to, to, to tell people about your progress. So we like seeing work in progress posted. And then his actual, yeah, he's got a great thread, 16 pages. His actual, let me find it. Let's see, somewhere after, among all this, he's got like the actual submission right here. All right, so he posted, this is homework submission week one in bold. This means I know that this is his final submission and I will grade this. 
Um, so that's how you submit it. And then for the next week, you do your work in progress and you do your week two post. All right, so that is how you submit homework. <laughs> Aaron, we'll talk later. We'll talk later, my friend. Um, uh, let's see, any other questions? Um, the week one agenda for, for this class it would be great if you spent an hour a day with, with Blender 2.8, uh, whether you're transitioning and you haven't really been into 2.8 um, or you're brand new to Blender and therefore 2.8 as well. I think you'll find that if you spend an hour a day for the first week, you will have made the transition. That's how it was for me when I was picking, when I was going from 2.79 to 2.8. Um, it took me about a, a week, an uncomfortable seven days of, of running over speed bumps and scratching my head, like where did that tool go? How do I do this? I know I know what I want to do, but I don't know how to do it. Um, it was about a week, and then after that week, I felt pretty um, acclimated to the new version. So it would be great if you spent an hour each day with Blender, whether it's it's working on the homework specifically, doing the treasure chest uh, example, or um, just playing around, like na just navigating the viewport. Um, if you're just navigating, you don't need to do that for an hour, but like. 20 minutes or so, you know, if you're just like orbiting and, and getting used to, to how to navigate. But um, yeah, so about an hour a day. Uh, watch chapter one of the treasure chest course if you haven't already. I know some of you might have already finished it even. Um, but the purpose of that treasure chest course for the class is to be the pre-recorded uh, workflow that you can that you can reference whenever we're not live. Okay, that's kind of the purpose of it. Specifically, chapter one is about modeling and that's what we're doing this week. And then homework is you choose one of the four assets and you model it. That's the, the homework for um, for this week. All right, question. If Blender 2.8 is buggy on your system and we explain that in our homework thread, will you account for that in your grading? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, I try to be very human when I grade in that, you know, I'm not a robot. Like I know that this stuff is relative. How I'm gonna grade Omar Dominic, for example. If he submits homework, he's already a very talented artist. I'm going to grade him differently than if you're picking up Blender for the first time. And while I'm not perfect at this, I think I'm decent at seeing the signs of like where you are in your experience. And I'm going to do my best to grade according to that. So it is a relative grading system. Also with the, with, you know, some of the standardized things that we talked about, um, um, trying to meet the expectation of, of the example, you know, like the examples that I've shown you already. Um, I, I designed those to be very achievable and I'm gonna be teaching it, so it should be achievable. But yeah, I try to be relative and grade as fairly and as humanly as possible. Oh, sorry, I, Angel Witch, I must've done the wrong thing. I guess I meant the file format for submitting the stuff, Google Cloud and linking. Oh, so the, I'm sorry, the, the submission itself, I did leave that information out. It's really just gonna be an, uh, an image or a set of images, like that's the expectation. So take either a screenshot of your, of your model, whatever the assignment is, um, screenshots, and then post those or a render. You know, once we get to shading and lighting, I'd like to see a final render. That's all you need to, to post. Um, and then any other information that, that would help me grade or, or tell me about your experience, like to, um, I mean, I can get along fine with just an image, but sometimes if it is just an image, I'll think like, okay, but like, were you like, you could have been trying to do this or that. And my advice would change depending on, on that information. So a little bit of extra context does help, but just images, as far as what to submit, you don't have to submit blend files. You don't have to submit like a sketch fab, for example, um, just an image really. And, but if you have a blend file, a problematic blend file that you want to share with me to take a look at, then that's what you would use the cloud uh, services for, to, to share that file with me. Wait, did I answer that question? Yeah. Um, can we get rid of crit critics as well? You mean critiques? Uh, Tobles, can you explain what you mean by this? All right, I think that's it. That is it. Wow, it took uh, 20 minutes longer than what I had hoped. I'm sorry, I know that can get talky, but I, I feel like it's pretty important information to get. Now, we're gonna move on then and jump into Blender, finally. So, 
Blender 2.8. Uh, the official, let's see the splash page. Uh-oh, where is that? Oh yeah, splash screen. Blender 2.8, very simply, 2.8. Exciting times. Official version, we're ready, we're ready to go. And I'm going to treat the next, I don't know, maybe I can keep it to like 15, 20 minutes, but um, try and keep this, like, like, I, like you just opened 2.8 for the first time. What do you need to look for? What is your first 10 minutes like with Blender 2.8? Um, it is just beautiful, isn't it? I, I agree. I, I think that the darker 2.8 is lovely. I think in general, it's so appealing to the eye. Um, I, yeah, I think that just the UI team has done a, a really great job, all things considered. It's a beautiful application. And um, so you open Blender for the first time. And this is specific, this class is especially about modeling. That's typically where people start because there's not a ton you can do in Blender without building things first. You can't rig anything that's not built. You can't animate any like non-existent objects. So the the modeling part of 3D creation is very important and it's where people start most of all. It's what this class is primarily about. So we are looking by default at the layout tab here. Layout and modeling look mostly the same. Um, in terms of what the UI looks like, but this this place I'm kind of taking you first. These are different layouts according to what you might want to do with Blender, um, and it it kind of follows the the pipeline of animation. Layout is like blocking things, making simple versions of your assets so that you can set up camera angles or you can you can visualize a pre visualization of your project. That's what layout is. Then you've got modeling, which is takes us right into edit mode. It's ready to, to move vertices around, create our shapes. Sculpting is, is you know, the next level of modeling in, in many ways where you're, you have digital clay. And so this takes us right there. UV editing, texture painting, shading. We're going to be jumping through a few of these, but today we just need to focus on modeling, not really even layout, um, even though that is the default. Either one is, is gonna be fine. Um, actually, what I like about modeling is it doesn't have the timeline at the bottom. So I actually would recommend modeling. Um, so those are your different workspaces and you saw how the user interface updated and changed. Um, let me ask a question real quick. Will there be training courses for Photoshop or Krita in the future? Yes, I am. Uh, uh, I mean, I, admittedly, I use those applications less in my 3D workflow and I do most of it in Blender. But um, unless you're asking about concept art, I don't really know about that. Um, I don't know if the demand is high enough for concept education to like warrant getting another person to do that. So I don't know, that's kind of a, a different topic and I'm not sure exactly what's gonna come of the concept part. Um, will there be uh, closed captions in the recorded version? Um, probably not because it's a little bit expensive to add the, the um, I just said the word closed captions. It's a little, it's expensive that we reserve for usually our more popular courses where more people are watching, but um, we don't typically do it for live streams. Uh, let me see if I missed anything else. Although it will be on YouTube. The recording will be on YouTube and I think they do automatic closed captioning, however accurate that is. Let's see if I missed anything. A very strict credit, like uh, you would be, you would critique a pro. Okay, yeah, uh, Tobel's, like you would critique a pro. I typically, if I'm completely honest, I think I do tend to lean towards critiquing like a professional. I don't mean if, if a beginner, if an obvious beginner is submitting homework, I'm not gonna critique them like as if they should be a pro. But like, I guess my, my mindset is you probably wanna be the best at this that you can be, right? Like that's what I assume going into a critique, whether you're beginner or advanced. And like in that way, I, maybe it's considered professional, but um, for you specifically, like I'm also open to like that critique wasn't really helpful for me, Kent. So can you, like, I'm really trying to do this. I don't want to go professional. I want to just achieve this, whatever this is. Like I'm open to to feedback on how to best critique you. I'm, I actually welcome that. That would be great. Um, But yeah, I guess my assumption is that anyone learning Blender wants to be good at it, um, I suppose. 
All right, so yeah, back to Blender 2.8. It's your first time in here, we're imagining. And where is the first place you wanna look? The most important place that you'll be interacting with as a modeler is going to be the 3D view, which obviously takes up the most real estate inside the user interface. And that's because so much happens here. It is a 3D creation suite. So of course the 3D space is going to be important. Um, but that that is this here, the main components of the 3D view is your tool panel up at the uh, the left side. So you can enable that with T. Um, the also, we also have the end panel, which is hidden by default, and that's the end key. Um, I also, while I'm at it, I'm going to enable screencast keys so that you guys can see what I'm doing, uh, what, what I'm pressing. Um, you won't see that in your Blender. It's an add-on that I installed. But uh, this end panel has important information like the item. If I select the box, we've got uh, information for its, its position in 3D space. We've got uh, tool options for if I choose an edit mode like uh, uh, the bevel tool, for example, you get options here. So the end panel is another important place to look. You've got view properties for how your viewport, you know, quote unquote camera is set up. You can change the focal length. Um, you can also change the clip values. Um, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to kind of not go into extreme detail for each of these spaces. I think it's most helpful if you see what that looks like in context of me actually creating something. But my goal with this, with this hopefully short explanation is to like, generally, where do you look? If you want to do an action on your object, then look at the tool panel, for example. I'm not gonna go over each tool specifically without context, but just that's where you look. That's where you're gonna find what you want. What do I, what if I want to change something about my viewport? Well, the view option in the end panel, that's going to probably have your setting. Um, that's kind of what I want to keep it with this explanation. Um, sorry, looks like I missed one. Uh, Concrescent asked what, what all those buttons are on the left, but it looks like you're getting into that now. Right, so your tool panel, I kind of mentioned it was there, but didn't really say what it was. Uh, this has, this is home to common tools, let's say. Um, you, there is a, a, a small um, invisible boundary that you can click and drag out. And so you can have it stack like, you know, Photoshop sort of does this. Krita, I think, does this as well. But you can, if you drag it out far enough, you can see the names of the tools. And and I'll be honest with you, uh, I, this is aimed towards beginners. So it's supposed to, it, it looks like, uh, it looks kind of like a Moto or, or a Maya, as I remember Maya, where it's got your common tools on the left side that are like big buttons that you can press. It's pretty obvious, like these are operations to, for example, bevel, Let's see if I can, yeah, for example, click and drag to bevel this edge or to make a loop cut. Like that's the idea of the tool panel. These are essential tools, but I, as having used Blender for a long time, I find this almost useless because I've, I've remembered the hotkeys for one, um, but also these work differently than just pressing the hotkeys. And I personally don't love how they work now, um, but it's a great place to start to, to get used to, oh, here's some essential tools. Also, there are so many more tools than what's visible here that it's just like a tiny taste of what Blender can really do to an object. And so I've found, no, out of no like prejudice towards it or anything, but I've found it's just not that, that useful if you have experience with Blender already. Um, but for a brand new beginner, I imagine it's probably helpful at least, um, although I would probably recommend dragging it out to see the full name because I don't know if the icons themselves make, make sense if you're brand new. Anyway, that's the tool panel. Um, but also at the top of our 3D view is some pretty important settings as well. Uh, you have the type of mode where you can switch um, object mode. Now I can do that quickly with the tab key. I should probably make a quick note about hotkeys. Blender is famous or maybe infamous for being very hotkey centric, which means there's a lot of tools with hotkeys that you can memorize. And while that there is a steep learning curve to that, once you memorize them, you are fast as lightning. Like it's, it's one of the fastest potential workflows for 3D. Um, and so like, for example, tab is an essential hotkey for going right into edit mode, giving me access to my vertices, edges, I also used another hotkey, which is the one, two, and three key above your letters on your keypad or your keyboard. Your keyboard. One is vertices, two is edges, three is uh, faces. And so, 
I'm still in, another reason I don't love the toolbar is I'm still in the loop cut tool, even though I don't want to do that. So I, you have to constantly, well, can you even, yeah, no, I have to, I have to go back to the select tool in order to, uh, to, to make selections like my face selection, for example. So that's why I usually just leave it on the select tool and then even hide the toolbar. But, um, um, yeah, so the, the, you've got your components in edit mode up here. Uh, you can switch your modes to object mode, to sculpt mode, um, weight paint mode. These are like how these are object context specific modes, and it will change depending on if you, on what object you have selected. Like you can't sculpt a camera, obviously, so uh, you can you don't have that option. Um, and then in addition, you've got uh, menu items that are also specific to your object. You've got um, well, this is view actually. This is this is like camera stuff. <laughs> um, now that I'm saying that, it's uh, you would you maybe would think would that be available in the view in panel? It's not a perfect interface. Let's just say that. But um, these are I, I want to keep it more general that these are menus full of potential tools that you would want to use. If we tab into edit mode, it, the context changes, and we've got um, our add menu where we can add mesh components inside edit mode. You've got mesh specific tools. I mean, this is a pretty big list itself, but then lists inside of lists. So tons of tools that you obviously cannot fit into one tool panel, but I, I go here way more often than I go to the tool panel. Um, edges, faces, very important menus. So uh, these are operation, the typically operation menus. So uh, tools are found here. In the next section, the middle section, this is transformations. All right, so you've got your transform orientations, like a global space, local space, um, I'm trying to think if I should do a quick demo about what local space is. No, I'm not going to do that until I start working, uh, actually building our our sword, which is to come soon. Let me uh, make sure I'm not missing any questions. Looks like I did. Um, asked, but all of those buttons are on the left. But look, okay, yeah, got that one. Question from Kington. Kinkin, Kinkin. Um, what do you mean with they work differently if it's the same tool? Okay, yeah, it's a little bit weird. Um, so I'll, I'll demonstrate that. In uh, I'm going to use the hotkey first because it's my preference. For the loop cut tool, control R is the hotkey. All right, so you can see it looks similar, but if I mouse wheel up, I have two edges that I'm going to cut. Mouse wheel up again, I have three edges I'm going to cut. Compare that to if I go to the loop cut tool, I'm mouse wheeling up and I'm zooming in now. Um, also, uh, you have in the end panel, you've got under the tool option, you can change the number of cuts, but it's not reflected in the widget. It's only showing one, even though I cut and it has three. So it works differently. You, you kind of see what I mean? Um, also, it's weird that after I perform the operation, it's weird only because Blender has never worked this way before. I've performed the loop cut, but I'm still loop cutting more. Whereas typically with um, traditional you know, Blender usage, you, you're like, I make a loop cut and then I'm done and I'm back to selection because that's typically what you want to do next. I want to select a new component to perform an operation. Um, but that's how they work differently. And, I, and if you start this way, maybe that's going to be more comfortable. But coming from the way Blender's worked for several years, I, I prefer the hotkeys. And all of these tools... Let's go through extrude region. That's the E hotkey. Inset faces. That's the I hotkey. I don't know why they're not listed here. Bevel control B. Loop cut control R. Knife tool K. Uh, poly build. That's a new tool. I don't really use that one. Um, it's. I mean, maybe it's not new, but I've. I, I do. I achieve that tool in a different way. Um, the spin tool doesn't have a hotkey, as far as I know. Um, yeah. So most of these, like the core ones, I have the hotkey memorized, and. Um, and I just like the way the workflow is. Uh, yeah, anyway, I don't know. What do you guys think about the tool panel? Any, anyone else in here, do you find it useful if you have already used Blender or do you find it kind of cumbersome? Um, I find it a little cumbersome, but again, I think a Blender, a Blender beginner will find it helpful. Um, is there an official hotkey cheat sheet for 2.8? Not that I'm aware of, but cheat sheets are a pretty hot hot like content piece. So if we don't create one, someone else will, whether it's it's Andrew Price at Blender Guru or 
or a CG boost, like that kind of stuff is, is usually comes out pretty quickly once, uh, once the new version is released. Um, you prefer the hotkeys. I gave it a try, but I don't like it. I, I need to use it anyway. Uh, my opinion is it's, it's one of those things that is limited at beginners. Like I'm, I'm not really, I can't imagine that this is more efficient. I think it's kind of like a baby step into how to use tools, but like, it's always going to be more efficient to work with hotkeys. Anyway, I've spent a lot of time on that. Um, so yeah, in the middle, we're talking about these buttons right here are like transform specific tools. So you can change your transform orientations, which I'll go over inevitably when I start modeling for real. Uh, pivot point, that's very powerful for, you know, how you rotate, whether it's around the center of the origin, whether you're rotating around the 3D cursor, for example, you're scaling towards a 3D cursor. Um, pivot point, very fundamental tool. Um, the snapping tools is beside that. So if we want to snap, if I duplicate this and turn on vertex snapping, you know, I can, I'm holding control now and it's snapping to verts. So this is how you could, let's see, snap to the box on top of each other perfectly. Snapping tools also extremely important. They're found there. And then proportional editing. I, this is interesting. I didn't know about Blender before today, before I was prepping for this, that you can enable proportional editing in object mode. And okay, so proportional editing is like, like transformation with a fall off. So, so it's kind of like an organic type of form of a transformation. So if I hit G to move and then mouse wheel to make the, uh, the circle bigger, the influence bigger, you can see that the other objects are being influenced proportionally, you know, in this kind of fall off manner. So that's pretty interesting. It's, it's been available in edit mode for a long time. Maybe it's been available in object mode and I just didn't know it, but, um, so that's proportional editing. Again, it, it's a more, if I tab into edit mode, it's a more, um, organic way to move, to move your components around, right? It kind of turns it into more of like a jello rather than a, a very geometric, you know, rigid thing. And you started in Blender and you didn't delete the cube. I know, I know, isn't that funny? Uh, it's almost tradition. Um, yeah, okay. So people who know the hotkeys, yeah, you tend to find it a little more useless. The toolbar. Actually, this is the tool panel, not toolbar. Okay, cool. Not missed any questions. Um, yeah, so that's kind of an overview of these transformation things that you want to be aware of. And finally, on the right side, this is, by the way, this whole top bar is called the, uh, the header. And you can, on the right side, we've got like viewport visualizations or decorations, right? So you can turn on and off these little icons, which are, you know, kind of viewport camera things. As I'm explaining this, I'm kind of realizing that viewport camera stuff is, is spread in random places. Um, you've got the ability to turn from perspective to orthographic. You've got the ability to look inside the camera or not look in the camera with that button. You can pan, you can zoom by clicking and dragging on these icons or click in the, the little axis gizmo and you're orbiting around. That's probably helpful if you are on a laptop, for example, and, and um, don't have a, a mouse, a proper like three button mouse. Um, but you know, these, these are literally useless to me on a desktop and having you know, um, used Blender. So if you're more uh, intermediate to advanced, then uh, I just turn those off, you get a little bit more screen real estate. And then um, you can do that there, turn on just specific ones if you want. You also have the ability to limit what type is in the viewport. So if you don't want to see any mesh objects or you don't want to see any cameras, you can do that here. Um, but yeah, this is like viewport visibility visualization stuff. That's what's happening in the upper right corner. Um, your wireframe, that's very important. You'll, you'll frequently jump in and out of wireframe mode. Uh, your solid viewport shading, um, which, which gives this kind of, I call it computery uh, shading to your models. You know, it's usually gray with a little bit of shadow, a little bit of highlighting. It's technically open GS or open GLS, open GSL. Is that what it's called? <laughs> open GSL shading, open GL, GL shading. Um, and, and then you've got look dev, which uses these brilliant little things called HDRI images, which is like a 360 image of, of your world, the outside environment, um, to, to create quick lighting 
And so this is a, a more closer to render uh, visualization, which doesn't really look great on cubes. It might look a little bit better on the monkey. Oh, I got proportional editing still on. Anyway, like this, uh, that has that's very, very useful. Um, and then you finally got your rendered view. All right, so all these have to do with how things are visualized in the viewport. Um, that's pr the most important things about the 3D view. And spending a little more time there, I think makes sense because you spend most time here. Now, as far as modeling, the other view, the other windows that we see, the other um, editors that we see visible in the upper right, this is called the outliner. And it's just a scene hierarchy organizational tool so that you can see how your how your uh, scene is is set up and it's very similar i think the best analogy is to think of of your uh, file browser on whether you're on windows mac uh, uh, linux or whatever is uh it's you know if you didn't organize your file system then you'd never be able to find files when you needed them and so that's kind of the idea of the outliner it 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 breaks down exactly what's in the scene, but also gives you the opportunity to organize it. So if you create a new collection, which collections, I think it's probably good as a beginner to think of those as a file folder. And then your actual objects are like the files within. And so um, if you want to, you know, what, let's make this, uh, this collection can be, uh, I often put camera and lights together. So cam lights for, as an abbreviation. And then I would throw the light and camera in there. Oh, they're already in there. Um, and then if I click the scene collection and add a new collection, we can call this uh, mesh objects. And then if I select that and add cube, add a cylinder, all those are being added. So we're organizing our file, our scene um, intentionally. That's what that's for. Now, when we're, we're going to be working with pretty simple uh, scenes for this, this class. And so the organization isn't going to be terribly important, I, I still recommend that you get used to doing that because once you get beyond the simple stuff and you start creating animations or environments with a lot of different pieces or complex models with a lot of different pieces, it's going to be very important to keep this organized. Um, let's see, is there any way you can ask a question in general on CG Cookie? Uh, other than, so the best way to ask a question is it's like just a generic question is probably to start a forum thread about it. But like on videos, if you have a question about a video, you can ask questions on the video itself. If you look on, um, if you look on the live, live stream page itself, you'll see where you can ask a question. Um, and it, that's a, it's exactly what it looks like on the videos. But uh, general is to go to the, the forum and ask and make a thread. All right, is there anything else? Oh yeah, so the other panel that's available to modeling, the modeling layout specifically, is the properties panel, the, the properties editor. All right, so you have your different contexts in tabs on the left side. You've got, uh, this is this is kind of, I, I feel like, what do they call it? The active tool and workspace setting. Um, yeah, this one's a new one to 2.8. It's kind of hard to explain, but uh, how do I even explain it? I'll tell you when I, I will explain it once I get to texture painting, which will be week two, which will be next week. That that gives me reason to go in here, but by itself, it's it's a little strange. I guess it, it does show, let me see if I go to green. Yeah, okay, so it's kind of a duplicate. It is a duplicate, it looks like, of the in-panel active tool settings. So if I tab into edit mode, it provides them there. It kind of duplicates the information. I don't know, again, not a perfect interface. You, I don't, you typically don't want like that kind of duplication as far as I know, but I'm not a user interface expert. Um, so yeah, maybe ignore this one for now, but very important ones are your render settings. That's not important right now, but once we get to the shading and lighting, it's super important. Um, and you've got your output settings, like your render output, your images, your movie files, where do they go? What, uh, what kind of, what, how long is the animation? What's the resolution? All that can be found here. Um, you've got View layers, which has to do with rendering. Um, what is this one? This is your scene. So uh, there's a you don't you don't visit this one too much. You know, I, I certainly don't. Not until you get more into the weeds of Blender. Um, but uh, you can. I'm not going to go over each of these in detail. The ones we will be paying attention to for sure is the modifier stack. That's where we can non-destructively modify our objects and do really cool 
uh, things to them, almost like built-in macros. But you'll see that um, in just a little bit. That's very important. And also object data. This one's very important because you have object specific settings and, and properties that you can edit in the properties panel makes sense. But um, that is properties. That's why these three v uh, views editors are visible. <sighs> so why did I do that? Why did I just explain those things? Again, I think back to when I got started and I wish I had someone explain to me the user interface of 3D Studio Max because I opened that program very similar to Blender if we start a new one. And I thought, what am I looking at? I get that I have a cube, but what is this thing? What is this thing? What are these icons? What do they even mean? What is this list? Like it was overwhelming when I first got into Blender, or when I first got into 3D Studio Max, a 3D application in other words, that I wish I had someone to just say, oh, that's a generic scene organization tool. This, These are your essential t operations to perform on your object. Um, these are very like more in-depth menus for what also you can do to your object. If you want to change how your viewport looks, you're going to want to do that up here. I just wish I had someone tell me that stuff. So I wanted to start by by pointing you to generically the, the right places to look. All right. I got about 45 minutes left to now model, actually do something. And that's good because I'm, I'm ready to actually do something. So let me make sure that I have not uh, missed any questions. Snap tool, how exactly does it behave? Control seems to make sure it does not snap and it only connects uh, to the sides. Uh, real quick for snapping specifically, um, the this is a toggle, this little magnet icon. And when you have it enabled, it means snapping is on all the time. But if you turn that off, you can selectively choose when to enable it by holding the control button, right? But if it's enabled and you hold control, it disables snapping. Um, so that it's a it's a toggle, I guess. And if you switch to vertex mode, for example, I have the magnet turned off. And so it will not snap unless I hold control and you can see it snap right there. You have a couple of other ad additional options like what actually snaps. By default, it's set to closest. So whatever closest vertex um, to what I'm snapping, that's what's going to snap to it. You can change to the the center, which is your object origin, and that is what will snap. Um, any other settings here? Nothing right now, but hopefully that's a, a quick, brief explanation of what's what's happening with the snap tool. I am going to use that once we uh, once we get started modeling. Can can you explain further on how to organize your outliner? Um, ye yes, I think it might make, it might help to make sense once, once I have like objects in the scene again. Um, but when you have, if you have any more questions about the outliner towards the end, I will be happy to clarify, but, but without context, I, th I think it's kind of a, a hard thing to, to make sense of. Um, uh, interface. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. When you're doing a project experience is the best teacher. Amen to that. All right, let's get started. Let's get started. I am a big proponent for reference images. Let me just for sure start with a new scene so, so we all are on the same page. Um, whenever I start a project, I like to look at a reference. If it's a character, if it's a human character, I like to have pictures of faces, pictures of a human body. Um, as much as I've done computer graphics, you might think, oh, you don't need reference. You've done enough characters. You've done enough things that you can model from scratch. and. I, maybe some people can do that. While I have done that before, I find it much slower than just having a couple images. Even if I'm already very familiar with those things that I'm looking at, it keeps my brain organized. Like it's it's almost like a a, a shortcut to what my brain needs to recognize. I, I'm 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 just talking weird. So let me just get started. I uh, I'm going to separate a new item in the user interface. This is also something very cool with Blender, but you can, as we switch through all of these, oh yeah, I wanna be on the modeling one too. Um, as we switch through the different user interfaces, you can modify any of these to be what you want. So I want a window, a new window specifically for my reference image. So you might've noticed that I can click on any corner by default, whenever you're not in edit mode, your cursor looks normal. Um, but then when you hover to the bottom 
or to any of the four corners of a panel, it turns to a crosshair. And um, if it makes sense for splitting, well, let's just say to split it, I'm gonna do it on this properties panel. I'm gonna click and drag up. And now I have a new panel that I can switch to be the image editor. Um, from here, I will open my reference image. Where am I at? EDU, live streams, classes, BC1, 1908 images. And this is, a Blender does have a pretty robust file browser um, that you know happens naturally, pretty much what you expect, but I love that you can also look at uh, thumbnails, for example, and so I know I want this image right here. Double click on it, and on any uh, panel, you can hold control and then hit space bar to maximize that panel. Now we're looking at the sword reference. This is all I need to, to like, to get going forward. Even though I've modeled this more than once, again, like it just helps to look and be like, all right, that's what I need to do next and do it. Rather than whenever I don't have a reference image, I find myself swimming and, and slowing down. And, and uh, I highly encourage reference image. That was a lot of explanation for reference images. Um, I got that. Let's start. Let's start. First thing, as as Aaron kind of mentioned out or mentioned earlier, is Blender by default has these three objects in your scene. Typically, uh, most people just delete them because um, it, you know you don't always need a camera right out of the gate. You don't always need a light. The only real benefit, in my opinion, is that whenever you go into rendered view, you actually see something. Whereas if these were gone, especially the light. You, would, you wouldn't see much, right? So it, it's just, I think that's the only reason they're there. But um, I typically you delete them all. Let's go back to solid uh, shading. And now I've got a blank scene with which to start. Is it possible to show add-ons based on the workspace you are using? Is it possible to show add-ons based on the workspace you are using? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer to how add-ons, if you can be specific in an add-on for a workspace to be visible. I haven't done much scripting in 2.8 and I know that they changed some API things. I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that one, Marco. Um, if anyone else knows, if anyone else has experience with add-ons, please fill us in on that. All right, so I'm gonna start with the hilt of the, of the sword, which as far as I can tell on my internet searching, includes the crossbar, which is the top part that you know sits on your hand, the grip where your hands go around, and then the pommel, I believe is what it's called here. Um, I'm not great with knowing the technical terms, but I think I know them today and I'm proud of it. So we're gonna start there, meaning we're gonna begin with a cylinder, all right? So that's how most things start in 3D from a what are called primitive objects. If we go to the add menu up here, mesh, and you've got plane, which is a, a, like a piece of paper, you've got a cube, circle, uh, UV sphere, icosphere, cylinder, all of these are just primitive basic shapes and, they, and we usually start there and then turn it into a, a unique shape. So a, a grip is a type of cylinder, it makes sense to start there. You also have the shift A hotkey. Let me turn on hotkeys again so you can see that. Um, so yeah, shift A is the hotkey to bring up that add menu and I'm going to add a mesh cylinder. All right, now something important, whenever you perform an operation in Blender, you have this little setting down here in the bottom. Um, if, you, if you reveal that, it is operation specific settings. It mirrors actually what is in the end panel over here. Although since I use the hotkey, you don't see that now, but um, Anyway, whenever you perform an operation, you have a temporary ability to change the setting. So if I wanna make fewer vertices, I know from, from rehearsing this that I want 12 verts to be um, the resolution of the cylinder. You can change how wide or how thin the radius is. I want it to be thinner to represent that grip. And then the depth, I forget, okay, that's just the height. Um, you can also tell it to what type of ingon to fill with. I'm going to choose nothing so that it's a hollow cylinder. And yeah, um, any operation that you do has these settings. But as soon as you do anything else, if I move my cylinder, whoops, if I move my cylinder and complete the operation, you see that it switches to the move tool. Um, and then from there, you can change these specifically. But that only appears right after you perform the operation. And I can't, even if I undo, 
I can't get back to changing the cylinder. I have to delete it and add it again, mesh cylinder. And it, it does remember the, the last settings you use. So that's nice. But anyway, that can trip people up knowing about that, that kind of hidden menu there, hidden settings panel, but um, it, it is important to know about. Uh, Aaron is asking, is it okay if we sculpt certain parts of our model um, or is it, is it a traditional modeling only? I mean, Aaron, I know you, you know, like I know your skill and I think that's fine. It, it might be a good exercise like to, to, I know it was for me. Like I, I, you know, I'm a sculptor. I like to sculpt, but doing none of that was, I don't know. It's kind of fun exercise to, to get out of my comfort zone. Anyway, you don't have to do uh, po strictly poly modeling tools. You can, you can do sculpting if you'd like. Um, it does just com make the workflow a little more complex. Um, especially if you like bake normal maps and all that stuff. John Hale, can you talk about scale units and what's a good baseline to use? I'm glad you bring that up because typically maybe it's, it's just laziness or impatience, but like I, I usually don't model according to scale, um, but it's probably a good habit to do. Uh, so if we're thinking about a sword, I'm just going to ballpark, you know, the, uh, the, the measurements here, but like, let's think of the grip specifically, you know, two hands together on top of each other. Let's say it's a double handled, you know, hilt. Then um, that is about, I'm in imperial terms, imperial measure system. Sorry, we're, we're weird in America, but um, that is about like eight inches. Okay. So to model that to scale, I'm going to go to our scene tab. Look at that. I said it wasn't an important tab and here we are using it right at the beginning. And you have this units setting, all right? So the default in Blender is metric as probably should be with the, with the world being that way. Um, but I'm gonna switch to Imperial just because I'm not as familiar with metric. And now just switching that, sys that, that setting in the end panel, if I look at my item, we've got the dimensions here and we're looking at 0.9 feet, which is, what is that in inches? Um, this is the dimensions. Anyway, it's telling us the feet dimension and I, I want it to be eight inches so I can type in the Z axis specifically. Oh, that's actually eight. That's 6.1 feet. That, that sword is massive. So I want to make this eight inches. I can type eight and then uh, for Imperial, do the, the quote to represent inches. All right, now it's eight inches. And, uh, but it's only that one axis. It's only the up and down. So now I can, if I want to scale the whole thing down, I really just need to mind what the Z dimension is when I scale. So let me scale with S and then look at that Z value until it gets to, uh oh, it's in, it's in feet. Let me stop and then see if it'll switch to inches. No. Um, all right, I guess that didn't, that kind of backfired. I need to know, I, I need to see that in inches basically. Um, what is 12? How do I get to, I'm, my brain's farting on the math. Um, let me just forget that. Um, let me just change it to eight inches. There we go. All right, that, that, there we go. Now I know that the, the length of the grip is, is to scale. And uh, so now my scene is therefore set up to scale. You start with the first object being in scale and the rest of your scene will follow uh, as long as you base it on this. So uh, tabbing into edit mode gave me a weird error. Very funky. Um, I'm going to, what I like to do is, is set my object on the grid as if it's a floor. So in 3D, you can see the grid, it's often referred to as a grid floor. So I'm going to set it on top. This is just a personal preference because I don't, I, I just don't like seeing my objects like intersected by the grid. So I move it on top. If it was a character, I'd set the feet on the grid and build up. If it's a car, I would set the wheels on the ground, that kind of thing. I feel like there's a, been a bunch of things said. 0.75 feet is eight inches. Thank you, Mark Smith. <laughs> Man, yeah. Uh, I, I graduated high school and even college, I swear, but uh, let's see. Oh, Kent, set your length units to inches. Jake, thank you. That That's the missing piece. Um, in the units, uh, I set it to imperial, but then length is set to feet. So if you switch that to inches, just as Jake said, now I should see in the dimensions eight inches. There we go. That would have that would have solved it. Um, all right. Now let's actually let's let's go into shaping this. I'm going to tab into edit mode, and the top of the grip is wider than the base. So I'm going to select those verts, which I did with. Uh, where are my screencast keys? 
There they are. They keep turning off on me. Um, in, uh, so yeah, the way to select con um, connected edge loops uh, is with Alt. Hold Alt and click, and you'll see that that click uh, that selects both verts in this edge or the entire ring at the bottom. And now I can scale the upper one specifically. Make sure that my pivot point is set to median, which is the default. S to scale up. Uh, maybe the top is a little too wide. There we go. So now we have this little taper. And then to create the bottom decorative pommel, I don't know if it's really that decorative, but the pommel, I'm going to extrude down with E and then Z. Okay, so E is the extrude tool. Let me do that again. E extrudes it, just like a, a pasta maker. You know, it, it like pushes out in, in the shape that you started with. So we're extruding more of the cylinder. But it, um, then, so when you do the E extrude, let me undo that again. There's actually two operations. You do E to do the actual extrusion, but then it takes you directly into a translation tool so that you can move it where you want to go. At this point, you can select an axis specifically, and I'm going to hit Z to do that. So now I'm extruding straight down in Z. I'm going to go a little bit down, scale out with the S hotkey, and then repeat that. E to extrude in Z again. Scale that down, and now we've uh, accomplished this shape, more or less. All right, so I need to fill the bottom. Also, I just use the number pad period to uh, to focus on your selection. Okay, that's really important because um, um, sometimes your, your viewport camera can get wonky and you, you want to just look at specifically what you're working on, make a selection, and hit period on the number pad. Um, this brings up another point. You'll notice that as I zoom in to my object, it starts to disappear and kind of erode away. This is called viewport clipping. And it's because the default like scale in Blender is actually pretty big, like that cube. When I, when I see the cube by default, um, actually, uh, it seems to have changed maybe. But um, anyway, the default cube is actually pretty large if you think in real terms. And so, the uh, a, a to scale sword is pretty small and the default clip values make it erode and you can't get in close you just need to change the clip values in the view properties all right so i've got my in panel out i've got the view properties selected and the clip start i'm going to make it clip in the viewport and then turn that down to like 0.1 maybe 0.1 inches all right so now we don't get that problem until we get much much closer um, tabbing it back into edit mode. Let's see. Might scale. I, I keep going back and forth, scaling this up a little bit. Maybe the pommel it needs to be scaled up as well. It's just a little too small, perhaps. I'm going to go to wireframe because in solid mode, you notice I drag, I drug a box around my selection. Box select, by the way, is the B hotkey. So hit B, and you're dragging out a box for selection. But in solid mode, it you don't get to select what's on the back side. You have to go to wireframe. And I like to go to wireframe using the Pi menu, holding the Z hotkey. And then you can um, go left for wireframe, up for rendered, or down for look dev. This is what you're choosing up here as well. So for the hotkey, just Z and wireframe over to the left. That can be done really quickly. In fact, once you get used to it, you'll be switching through these in a blink of an eye. Um, all right, so what was I doing? I think I was trying to scale the pommel up. Scale that. Um, just the two, just the bottom two segments, I mean. Question for you guys. Am I being a little too heavy on explanation? Or can I explain less and, work, and, and do more work? Uh, I feel like I'm explaining literally everything I'm doing and it's, it's just taking forever to get anywhere. Tell me, like, how about one in, press one in the chat if, st if keep doing what I'm doing, explaining at this level, or press two in the chat if I should explain less. Let me see if I miss any questions. How to adjust the viewport clipping. Okay, yeah, I, I did that. You're on the same page as me. Looks like the chat's a little bit slow. Is that just me? Two, two, all right, all twos, great. Um, so I will explain less and do more work. Um, awesome, so I'm at the bottom. I need to fill this. 
I can do that with the F hotkey. And then I like to bevel just to give it a nice smooth edge with control B. And that's going to uh, um, cut the hardness off. And then I can kind of, by default, it's just the two. So I'm gonna select, you know, a range and then open those tools and increase the number of segments to make it smoother. I think probably two is gonna be fine. All right, so how about those details that we see? I'm gonna segment the grip into three. All right, so we've got three, actually four, I'm sorry. I'm gonna cut three edges. Um, I'm gonna do that with the Control R hotkey. Um, and, and then scroll up with uh, my mouse wheel. So I have three cuts now. Is that what I did? Yeah, three cuts. Um, and then like extrude, it goes into a second tool. I don't wanna slide my edges. I just wanna right click because that's going to put, put the uh, three segments directly in the middle of my mesh. Now I'm going to go to edge mode, which is the two hotkey. And I'm going to select all of those. I'm um, to add to your selection, you can use the shift key. So alt clicking, you know about, but then if I alt click on each of them, it, it eliminates the previous selection. Um, alt clicking, but holding shift will add to your selection. Very, very uh, important thing to, to know. I can hit control B to bevel these again. And with those additional segments, maybe you can see where I'm gonna go with this. I'm, I'm kind of dragging out the ring th uh, thickness. And then I do wanna add one more segment for a total of four. All right, now the, now the next step, follow, follow, my, follow my steps because I'm gonna uh, hit control minus. That is the shrink selection. You can see exactly what it did. Whoops. Um, this is how it started, control minus shrinks the selection. Alt S will push them out. So now we have the thickness to the ring. Control minus one more time and do that again. All right, so just that center edge loop. And what this has done is given us a round profile. I'm gonna grow the selection, control plus, and then scale according to, whoops, according to my individual origins. All right, I'm changing the pivot, right? So I talked about pivot points being important. Typically, by default, you're on median, but now I'm using individual origins because you can see what that does. It rotates the selection relative. Um, and so I wanna scale in Z slightly. All right, this just uh, forms the profile a little bit better. Although maybe I need the center to be a little bit, I'm gonna Alt S again. Oh wait, Alt S does not work great with individual origins. I need that to be median point, Alt S. Also, one more thing, if you find that that um, when you, if I Alt S and it's too finicky, like it's too sensitive, hold Shift while you're moving and that will make it a, a more subtle movement. All right, so I wanna be subtle and get that perfect. All right, so now we've got the round profile to the rings and I need to do the same thing to these. I forgot, I need to bevel first, Control B and then Control minus. Uh, why isn't that working? Control minus, there we go. Alt S to push it out. Control minus one more time, Alt S. And then this one is a little weird because it already had a curve to it. There we go. All right, so we've built that, that uh, the grip and pommel. Uh, control minus doesn't work on Mac. What? It did when I was on a Mac. Is your number pad, uh, is your number lock on? Maybe, uh, I think that on my Mac keyboard, it's the clear button. Um, yeah, weird, that's strange King Con. I'm not sure why that would, why that would be happening. Um, weird. All right, so uh, let's talk about low poly right now because if we tab to object mode, we've got the shape matching what we see in the reference, but it's faceted. It almost looks like it's made out of cardboard or paper mache or something, like very, very faceted and we don't want that. We can select the object, right click and choose shade smooth. All right, this is, this is normal smoothing. That is the, um, the term, it's your, your, your faces have normals and uh, they can be set to be flat shaded or smooth shaded. Um, now, the problem with this is it looks really good on the cylindrical parts, it makes it look more round, but um, the, there's not a, a definitive cutoff for the ring versus the cylinder, and I wanna do that now. So I can tab into edit mode, 
in edge select, uh, choose the edges on the top and bottom of each ring, either side of the ring. All right, and then next you can right click and choose set uh, mark sharp. All right, that, um, that doesn't do anything except add this blue line until we go to the properties panel and your object property, your object data properties specifically. So click on those and you have this normals uh, section. Under there, we can enable auto smooth and you'll get an effect right away. If we tab to object mode, it'll maybe make more sense so we don't see all the edge components. Um, but some edges are set to, to sharp and some are set to flat uh, to smooth. And the, d the reason is your angle is set to 30. It's saying that any face with a, I can't I forget if it's lower or high, higher angle than 30 will be either flat or smooth. So I'm gonna go all the way up to 180 because that says all edges will be smooth. And then you can, uh, when you have auto smooth enabled, it takes those edges that we marked sharp and sets them as, as sharp. So basically um, I set the angle all the way up to 180, mark my edges sharp, and then auto smooth will listen to those sharp edges that I selected. So now, now it's looking a lot better. It looks smooth, it, it gives us this illusion, especially when we look at it from this far away, that it's not low poly, right? Because low poly, you can tell when you're, when you're looking at low poly, you can see that this is a jagged edge, a jagged circle. And you don't usually want to ever see that unless it's the specific style you're going for, but we don't want that. We want low poly to look like it's high poly. And um, this is by, by setting those normals properly, having just enough geometry to, to accomplish the illusion. Um, that's how, that's like the nature of, of low poly. Um, and I really, why I'm doing it low poly is I didn't want to mess with uh, subdivision surfaces really. That I think is a little more intermediate and it's just going to be easier for us to um, accomplish these shapes, for, especially for a beginner um, with when we go low poly. All right, so we are done modeling the grip and pommel. Let's move on to the cross guard. Um, oh, Kent, you don't need to be box select. Really? <gasps> That's amazing. Spiky, thank you for that. I did not know that, but now it makes sense. So in the tool panel, You've got regular select, which is how Blender used to work. Um, then you've got select a box, select a circle. By default, select box means we can click like normal, but also drag a box. That is much better. Good job, Blender devs. Um, so uh, thank you for that spiky too. I didn't realize that. Oh, so there were a few ones in there. Okay, okay. Hopefully I'm... Uh, if I get too fast or anything, maybe just let me know in the chat, I guess. Um, am I missing anything else? I missed the viewport clipping solution. Okay, yeah, no problem. Um, in viewport clipping, the default, let me see if I can, it, by the way, any setting in Blender, you can right click and reset to default value. So it's 3.94 feet, meaning that in about four feet away from the camera, all our objects will start planing away and eroding. So I guess I'm about four, I'm more than four feet away at this point, but as I start getting closer, Oh, inches, inches, I'm sorry, not, not feet. Um, as I get into four inches close to the object, it starts planing away. And I'd simply need to make that value small, meaning that it won't start planing away, can you see this, until I'm closer to the object. All right, so I'll go like 0.1 inches so I can be really close before it starts planing away. Um, that's how you fix the, the, the clipping value. All right, so the cross guard, Kent, are you making a Roman sword or a medieval sword? I don't really know. I just kind of made the sword from looking at a, a random different sword designs. If I were honest, I would say that the sword, the, the blade is from Ocarina of Time. It's the master sword, if I, if I were to be so bold. And then the bottom reminds me of Aragorn's sword. <laughs> so um, I don't know if that's medieval or Roman or Middle Earth. Middle Earthian, Hyrulean, Hillian. Anyway, it's a it's a it's a hodgepodge. By Lion, by Lions. Oh, someone named Lion is leaving. Oh. Thanks for joining us, Lion. Have a good rest of your day. Um, you can always watch the recording later. Not a question, Kent. Uh, you can toggle the selection modes using the W key. 
Look at you guys teaching me. That's nice. That's really nice to know. The W key no longer is edge specials or whatever, but it's toggles of selection. Brilliant. I like that. Middle Hyrulean. <laughs> All right, so on to the actual crossbar. Uh, I'm going to start from a cube and we're going to use some modifiers. Uh, shift A mesh cube. All right, we're going to add that thing. Okay, so this is the default cube. It is how many feet in dimension? Anyway, it's big. It's big. It's way bigger than I ever really expected whenever you're looking at the default scene. I mean, it's like the size of a like a washing machine, I feel like. Maybe not quite that big. Microwave, maybe? Anyway, don't know why I care so much about that. I'm going to tab into edit mode. And uh, actually, I'm going to take, I'm going to be in object mode and I'm going to move this object so that the origin, this orange dot, which every object has, is, is about placed where I want it to be for the, the crossbar. And um, the reason I'm doing that is I'm going to be using a mirror modifier and it it's just helpful to have that in the center of the object um, positionally. So now tab into edit mode and I can scale in Z to where we have about the height of the crossbar, SX so that we have the width of the crossbar ballparked. And then from the side, I don't think I mentioned this yet, on your number pad, the one hotkey takes you to front orthographic as you can see here. Um, that's helpful for just looking at a like a, a side view blueprint version of your model. Then three takes you to the side view, uh, seven takes you to a top view, and then control plus any of those keys is the opposite. So control one is back, control three is the other side, and then control seven is the bottom. And you can see that always identified in the upper left. But um, three, I've been doing those keys and haven't been telling you. Um, so S, I'm in the, in the side view and the hilt is pretty large. The, uh, the crossbar is pretty large. So S, Y, I'm gonna scale that down, go to shaded view. That's actually a pretty good thickness. Oh my word, I saw someone mention save. Yeah, I haven't saved yet. Saving is of course super important. Um, way too many times I have streamed and never saved and lost all this. So let's save the file and we're gonna go to edu live streams classes bc1 1908 scene i'm going to call this rec for record um or i should probably call it live R -E rec is my typical thing when i do a tutorial anyway uh, rec sword 01 all right save the first version um now to sh to better shape the crossbar let's zoom in and Let's see, how can we use the mirror modifier? Let's think about this smart. That's because it's a very powerful uh, tool to be able to use the modifiers. So uh, I can do it horizontally. It can be, it's symmetrical in the horizontal, the X axis. So I can control R, cut an edge right down the middle and then right click so I don't slide that edge around. Go to vertex mode, box select. I still am in the habit of pressing B. I, I, I don't need to do that anymore. X and X brings up your delete menu. I'm going to delete the vertices specifically. I feel like I've been talking a mile a minute. So let me uh, get a touch of water. All right, so we have eliminated half of the object and we can now go to the modifier panel, which is the wrench icon and mirror, uh, choose the mirror modifier. By default, it's going to mirror in the X axis, which is perfect what we want and uh, this is great. This is this is not like real life. Um, if you were building this sword for real, because we get both sides identically for free. Even more than that, I can get the Y direction mirrored also. Control R, cut an edge there, select and delete these vertices, and then enable Y mirroring. Even cooler. Now I've got the the left and right, front and back mirrored. I can't. I'm not going to do that for the up and down axis because there it, it's not. Uh, it is asymmetrical, but um, if it was perfectly symmetrical, you could do both, uh, or you could do all three uh, axes. Now, I'm going to go to the front view, and I'm going to create this curve that we see in the crossbar. Oh, man, we got 10 minutes, and I got to do the whole blade. Uh, all right, time to put pedal to the metal and not explain, explain even less. Make sure I don't, I'm not missing any questions. Good. 
All right, so I'm cutting these edge, ooh. Cutting these edge loops, I'm gonna cut, let's start with three. And then I'm gonna leave the bottom flat, this, this first segment flat, go to local view, I mean local view, go to uh, wireframe view. And let's move these verts up in sequence. So move a little bit up, deselect. By the way, um, whenever you box select, oh, if you wanna deselect, box select, okay? So I've always been adding to the selection, which you can do by default. Um, but if I want to deselect, I, I think I do have to hit the B key because it's middle mouse select, B and then middle mouse click and drag. So is that, it, do I have to do that? Um, whoever, whoever, uh, gotta go fast. Whoever uh, corrected me, um, I guess I'm asking, do I have to hit the B hotkey to box, to D box select? Um, I think Spikey might've been the one that told me that. Uh, all right, B box, uh, middle mouse select. Now we've got a curve to our, uh, our crossbar, excellent. Bye, Miranda. Have a good one, and um, see you soon. I am, I am going to reply to you. We, uh, we have an email going, so I'm going to reply to you. Unfortunately, yes, B to D select. Okay, that makes sense. No big deal. All right, now, um, three segments I feel like is a little too low poly because I think that this the faceting is a little more noticeable, too noticeable. So I am going to bevel these. Select all three, control B to bevel. And now we're gonna get a much smoother curve, but I don't need that many segments. Let's go down to like two. Yeah, that's gonna be much less noticeable. There we go, looks, looks great. Oh, but I shouldn't have done that quite yet. Let me undo that because I did not pay attention to the top. I don't want this to be flat across. I want it to taper as well. So let me go to wireframe view and move these into a manual taper. There we go, that's the shape I'm after. Now it makes more sense to bevel because in addition to just getting the, um, these facets smoothed out, we'll also get from the top from the top view. So control B, drag those out. There we go, nice and even. And then the last thing I'll do is bevel these edges, these uh, hard 90 degree angles. Control B to bevel. Excellent, I think that looks good. Right click and shade smooth. That's gonna be the final test. Oh, you know what I forgot? Uh, I forgot another ring on the bottom. I'm not gonna worry about it. In the design, I think I put one of these rings on the connection into the, the crossbar, but it's gotta go fast. If you open the header, you can Boolean the box select, uh, add, subtract. If you, let's see, if you open the header, let's see, do you mean, I don't know what you mean by the header. If I go to the tool panel or, or the, um, this you mean? Ah, maybe this is what you're talking about. Yeah, selection, that's what you can do. So, um, by enabling that, no? That's weird. Do you mean the top bar? So here's a secret I did not really plan on going on in this episode, in this uh, video, this live stream, but there's actually a hidden top bar. It's literally hidden. Um, but if you right click on any of these buttons and go to header, show tool settings, that is, um, it, it's it's literally this thing, this panel, but but duplicated over here. It's also duplicated here. We've got it in three spots, three potential spots. You guys have heard me kind of uh, joke about this before, um, but I actually like this. I, I like leaving this panel hidden and having the the ability to select the tools up here, especially in like sculpt mode. But anyway, the the booleans don't seem to work for me. If I got everything selected. Am I choosing invert? Oh, subtraction. Ah, okay, yeah, you can select it there. Um, but to do it on the fly, this also means I no longer can add to the selection unless I hit B. Anyway, I'm getting hung up a little bit on this. So, right, let's move on to the blade, which I do think is maybe the most fun part. 
All right, we will start with another another cube. It's going to be similar in that we can use the mirror modifier um, on a on a, a very thin cube. Shift A mesh. Well, I'm going to do something different actually. Instead of starting from a primitive, like I said, this is already set up with the modifier that I want, the mirror modifier in the proper axes. So what if I just duplicate this, move it up a bit, and then start from scratch. Um, let's just select one face right here. Control I to invert X and faces. All right, now we can move this without having to start from a primitive. We have uh, accomplished, you know, we've got, we've got, we're well on our way with the modifiers already set up. So we're moving a little bit faster. So let's move this in X. I'm going to make a simplified version of the shape first. I like that little decorative piece on the end, or like a, a little curve on the on the uh, where it connects to the the crossbar. Also, I need to think about how the taper is going to happen. Hmm. Maybe I'll just go ahead and uh, I'm just going to leave it as a flat plane right now. Let's just focus on the shape from the front angle. I'm going to E to extrude both verts up so that we get the length of the sword and then move this one in so it's not, you know, we have that, that thin taper. And then I think I'll just manually create the curve. Now with, uh, to extrude, you can do the E option, but you can also control right click, hold control and then right click and that will draw new vertices automatically. And then for that last one, I'm going to hit E. Now, we have an option in the mirror tool to, to enable clipping. This means that whenever we cross the horizon of symmetry, it's going to stick there. That's really nice. Now, now I know it's perfect aligned in the center. All right, let's get a nice curve to this. I feel like it's too um, subtle, right? Or it's too, uh, this, the curve happens too quickly. All right, now I need to figure out how to get an easy way to get uh, this, uh, the, the, sharp, the sharpness of the blade, sorry. Um, all right, we're gonna be done soon. It, you, you're welcome to leave, I guess. I did, I might go over the two hour mark, but I do, I'm pretty close to finishing the blade. Um, so I am gonna finish it. If you wanna stay over the two hours, that's fine. Otherwise, you're welcome to leave and you can watch the, the um, what you missed in the recording. But sometimes I feel bad for keeping you longer than two hours. Is there a reason why you don't use the bevel modifier? You know, I just have never really used the bevel modifier. To me, it seems... I don't know. It's just not the method that I would prefer. I, I see people use it and I think it's absolutely fine to use it, but... It's never, it's never really been my preference. I think that's really the, the best reason I have. So it's probably a dissatisfying reason, but anyway, um, I'm gonna move on to filling this with thickness. All right, I know this is an ingon right now, but I'm gonna, but that's okay to me. Um, I'm trying to think, yeah, okay. All right, so I've filled that in. Now I can add the thickness of the blade by selecting the entire outside edge, alt clicking, let's try that again, alt clicking on the outside edge, and then manually selecting these faces, and then E to extrude in the Y direction. Oh, I missed a, a, an, a vert. There we go. Sorry, this is a simple shape, but I'm trying to think the, the most, the ideal way to create it. And I don't think I was doing that. Let me turn off Y mirroring for now. And I'm gonna move this. I don't wanna confuse you. All right, let's start fresh. I'm going to undo, I will do, um, I will enable Y mirroring, but I'm gonna move my face to be flat in the Y direction. Okay, so it's, I'm just moving all my, my blade components into the Y direction. Now I will turn off Y mirroring and in my front view, I can use the I key to inset basically the, the what do you call it? The angle of the blade sharpness. 
Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna set it right there, and then in my optional uh, operator settings, operator settings, uh, I can choose boundary and ah oh, no I can't bummer they're both boundaries uh, forget that so I'm just gonna have to fix the middle here. Uh, there could have been a more optimal way that I went through this. I'm gonna delete these verts, and I need to select the the edges that that got inset unintentionally like this, then move them into place. All right, is this what I wanna do? Um, actually, no. I wanna remove this vertice, vertex. Woo! I used to say vertice, and people quickly corrected me that that's not actually the singular form of vertex, so. I take it back. Um, I am snapping to this vertex so it's flat, and then we've got a consistent, a consistent um, border now around the sword blade. All right, so here I can simply move the interface interfaces forward in Y to give me a little thickness, and now I will re-enable the Y mirroring. There we go. Now we've got some thickness to the blade. I need to inset again. Oh, now, okay, now I should be able to inset the way I like. I can inset just a little bit more because we're going to, to give this channel down the middle and I can uh, disable boundary. Okay, so this is what I was trying to do. And now when I inset the thickness, there we go, that's perfect. And then this gives me an op uh, opportunity to move inward in the Y direction. There we go. That's the shape that um, that I am going for. Let's see from the side view how thick that actually makes the blade. It's actually really thin. Maybe I, sh maybe I should make it not so thin or control plus and make the blade a little thicker overall. There we go. I think that was a better decision. Now, let us bevel and get this really nice curve at the base of the blade. What's a good way to do that? I'm gonna cut an edge loop with Control R and then move these faces, these edges, inward. Oh, look at that. That's not looking great. I'm gonna turn off clipping and then move these out. There we go. All right, so I've got a, a, an exaggerated, jagged form of the curve, and then I can just use the bevel tool, bevel uh, uh, control B, bevel operator, and get that nice curve. Maybe add one more segment. There we go, it looks nice. Now, I think all that's left is to harden the edges and also add some, some of these little dents and dings. So to add to add the dents and dings, I actually should probably do that um, without the mirror modifier because I don't want it to be perfectly symmetrical. So while I've got the symmetry, let me select some faces, some edges to be hard and and not smooth. Control E and mark sharp. Also enable in our object data. Let's enable auto smooth. Set the angle all the way up to 180. Very nice. Oh, there's a there is another edge I should set hard. Control E, mark sharp, and then I think one at the top too. Control E, mark sharp. There we go. Not too bad. Not too shabby. Maybe the the top actually is a little more broad than I would like. So let's just select these uh, uh, verts. I'm going to select this middle one as the uh, because when I deselect it and reselect it, it makes it the active object, the active component, and then I can choose active element and scale in X toward that specific vertex. There we go. Just a little bit more taper. I like that. Question: What does the boundaries do by the inset tool? Sure, I'll show you that again. Boundary, basically, if we turn off our mirror modifier, this edge is a boundary because it, it just ends, right? It's like the horizon of symmetry. 
And so if the bevel tool detects one of those boundaries, whoops, not E, but I, that setting will tell it to ignore the boundary. And so it does not bevel or does not inset along that boundary. And it's just perfect for this specific use case. Um, I really need to probably cut an edge here with the K knife tool, cut that across. And now we've got triangles, all triangles and all quads. And then re-enable the mirror modifier. All right, so yeah, the only thing left to do for the model is just to add some dents and dings. I'm going to apply this modifier now. It's a true object. And to add the dents and the dings, what's the best way to do this? I'm gonna control R and cut a few edges. I like to do this just so that I have additional geometry to work with. Without it, you know, it's, it's, it's not enough geometry. So control R, let's cut a few new edges. And then from here, you know, I can split these apart with the knife tool. I did this in the, I did a similar thing in the treasure chest course where you can just cut new edges and um, let's see, how am I going to, let me think this through first because I could delete these and then connect them. And now I've got a massive cut in the blade, which I think is too big. So if I want to make it less deep, I need to add another edge along the uh, along the blade this way. And do the same thing for the back. All right, now I can, what I can do is it makes it a little more complex. Let's cut that same, same thing again. This time I will, Let's see, maybe cut another edge in the middle. J to join those. Yeah, that's what I should do. J to join there as well. J to join. And then scale this down. All right, now I've got a, a similar ding, but it's not quite so deep. Now I just need to set these edges as sharp. Whoops. Also another selection, a helpful selection thing is if you have an element selected and hold control and choose another uh, edge or another component, it's the shortest path. So it chose the shortest path from one selection to the next. That's, that's really helpful. Um, like in this case, I'm just holding control and kind of going along the, uh, the edges that I want and it's filling in the gaps in between. Control E and mark sharp. There we go. Now, if I wanna add another cut at like an angle, for example, you know, I can move these down, move these up. I mean, really, since it's such a simple shape, it doesn't matter too much. And then from here, I can, whoops, K to cut. And then I need to actually refine this to be pretty straight. These kind of gouges tend to be straight, not like curved or anything. And then let's control R to cut an edge down the middle, then link up. The reason it doesn't cut all the way to this other vertex is because it's a triangle and the, the uh, um, loop cut tool depends on quads, all, all uh, four-sided uh, polygons to work properly. And so I just need to fill that in myself. Um, actually, this is not really gonna make sense. I was gonna push this inward, but that doesn't really make sense, does it? Like what is going to cut this, in, this inside portion? So this was kind of a waste. That's just, that wouldn't happen really in reality. Let me undo, I think what I meant to do is cut like this. Probably should have practiced the, the, this um, adding the dents and dings uh, because I'm, I'm remembering now when I was rehearsing, like uh, when I p first posted the class that this was actually trickier than I expected. And uh, I'm remembering that now. All right, there we go. Maybe not quite so deep. And yeah, merge these. Okay, that's that's better.
Then I will control E mark sharp and then make this mark sharp as well. But this one I will make, I will clear the sharpness. There we go, little dents and dings. All right, so those are pretty small. Um, I would wanna add those to the, to the rest of the blade, but I don't wanna show you this repetitive process over and over and over again. So I think this is a good stopping point. Uh, next week, we will pick it up with texture painting. And um, is there anything else to tell you? Does anyone have any questions that I can answer before we sign off? It, I think we've kind of settled into just a watching kind of mode, but if you have any last minute questions, let me know. Other than that, going through the rest of the week, watch the treasure chest course if you haven't already, uh, because you're gonna see these workflows presented a lot more streamlined. You know, I'm not trying to talk about it live, but it's it's like, uh, it's rehearsed, well rehearsed, well recorded, like straight to the point. But I use very, very similar techniques all in the same realm of modeling. Um, so you'll find them applicable to whether you choose the sword, the barrel, of course, the treasure chest or the sign. And uh, it's, okay, it's okay to model the chest for the homework. Yes, it is. If you haven't, I, if you haven't already modeled it for the course, right? Like that, that would be kind of, kind of lame. If you already modeled it and then you submitted it for homework, that's kind of lame. But if you haven't watched the course, you haven't modeled the treasure chest, you can definitely do that as homework uh, for this class. Anything else I'm missing? Save, good call. A lot, uh, the, more, the more regular chat members are my save police and, um, and I, I appreciate what they do. All right, I think that's it, no more questions. But yeah, if you do have any more questions, of course, ask them in the, in the homepage thread. Kent, that weird moment, uh, the treasure chest course, oh wait, Kent, that weird moment in the treasure chest course where a ghost seemed to start extruding random extra faces was quite bizarre. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yes, I agree. That was that was weird. Oh, there are questions. Sweet. Um, I don't get a menu, and I still, Jake, I still don't know what exactly was causing that. Um, I don't get a menu when I right click in object mode. Is it because you're right click for, is it because I use right click for select? Yes, if you use right click select, I I don't know, Let me let me test. If I go to edit preferences, by default, this is a big change if anyone's new to Blender. It's always been right click select in Blender up until 2.8. So uh, it's been, it's caused some controversy, but uh, interface, is it, where is it? I've already forgot, forgotten. Where is it? Navigation, where is right click select? Here we go. A key map, select with left. If I go to right, oh, that's weird. How do you even select with left? Oh, right click select, jeez. All right, I've never done this before. Right click select and then in edit mode. Yeah, I guess you don't get that option if you use right click select, so I've always been a left click selector, changed it like day one when I got into Blender. Um, so I guess I recommend it for 2.8, unless you're like a, a true legacy user. Um, let me see. From Tebow, for the whip thread, can we go with very early stuff? Wait, from the whip thread, we can go with very early stuff? Yeah, it's at your discretion. Like I'm not, I don't wanna pressure you to post your work in progress, um, but uh, unless it's for your, like, I just know as an artist, yeah, at the end of the day, working for CG Cookie, we have this thread where we always say like, so what'd you work on today? And the purpose is to like, look through your day and realize there was value in it and then like, talk about it. You know, it just helps to, oh yeah, I did do that today. That was good. So it's in the same spirit with the work in progress. Like if you work for three hours on, on, a, on making a sword or something, then you can post, hey, this is the end of day one. Like this is where I've gotten so far. Also, it's good if you have questions like, I got stuck on this part of the modeling or this tool, can you help me? It makes sense to post work in progress then too. But um, if you if you don't post a lot of work in progress, that's okay. I really just, what's, what's required is that you post a final homework submission. So yeah, if you wanna post early, you know, like every single day, this is where I'm at, that's totally fine. Um, 
Did I miss any other questions? I don't think so. I've kept you 15 minutes over. I appreciate you guys showing up. Um, okay, yeah, I think we're going to sign off then. I look very forward to doing this class with you. I'll be present in the homepage thread as well as your individual homework threads. So we will be in, in consistent communication for the next three weeks. Um, yeah, with that, I will see you live next week. See you in those threads uh, the rest of these days, the, week, the, the days of the week. So um, thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, and I will see you next time.